I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International. Welcome everyone to our Spiritual Awakenings International Presents event today. We are delighted at how Spiritual Awakenings Inter International has grown as, and is international. We are now in 93 countries around the world. Our latest country, believe it or not, is Botswana. So please take a moment now and just chat, put in the chat where it is you're joining us from today. Some people are already doing that from Seattle. I'm joining you from Encinitas, California. And our speaker today, I'm absolutely delighted, is joining us from Bangkok, Thailand. Oh, we have <laughs> someone north of the UK who's here. Welcome everyone from around the world. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Sean Blackwell. He is a native of Toronto, Canada, but presently lives in Brazil. And as I said, we're delighted that he is speaking to us today from Bangkok, Thailand. Sean has been researching and teaching about the spiritual dimension and healing potential of bipolar disorder for 17 years now. He's the host of the YouTube channel, Bipolar Awakenings, and the author of the book, Am I Bipolar or Waking Up? And in 2013, Sean started the Bipolar Awakenings Healing Retreat. So it is my great delight to turn it over to Sean Blackwell. Okay. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. And I'll just get right into the share screen and start the presentation, all right? Okay, this is me. We're gonna to talk today about the spiritual dimension and healing potential of bipolar disorder. And we're gonna do a few things. First, we'll go through my background a little bit, then some theory, and then practice, all right? So let's take a look at the background here, my background. I began studying the relationship between the concept of spiritual emergency and bipolar disorder in 2007. So yeah, it's it's been a while. And with my YouTube channel, Bipolar Waking Up, I spoke with thousands of people online who had had spiritual experiences and received a psychiatric diagnosis. All right. And this is me uh, with my very first video back when I had a lot more hair. And that was when I was sharing my story of what I had seen as a spiritual emergency. Now, um, if, if, if you're not familiar with that term, it's a term that came from Dr. Stanislav Grof. And what it meant was a type of spiritual experience that becomes very difficult to integrate. And you can end up in the psychiatric hospital because you sort of lose your functionality, even though you can see a strong spiritual side to it. And in my case, what had happened was I was on a self-help seminar called the Landmark Forum. And I had had a lot of changes in my life. I had moved cities. I was sort of in between jobs. And I was dealing with a lot of sort of stress in my life. I took this self-help seminar. And they had a very intensive, uh, well, it wasn't, I didn't think it was intensive, but they had a meditation where we focused on our fears. And when I focused on my fear, together with another 150 people in the room, I remembered a scuba diving accident I had had two months earlier. And in that moment, I felt a punch in my chest. And it was just this, this big wave of energy came through my heart. And I felt the fear finally that I had never felt from my scuba diving accident. And I started crying and I was trembling. And that began, well, a bit of a mystic journey. Because then after that, all my I had a sense of all knowingness. And then I was kind of a way to the races, you might say. Okay. And that's what got everything started. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more in the presentation, but I did end up in the psychiatric hospital. And uh, but luckily I was there for only four days. I sort of quickly realized that I needed to get out of that environment. And I just told the psychiatrist what they needed to hear. But um it was, I, I recognized from the very beginning that it was a powerful spiritual experience and that it was good for me, that it had been a breakthrough, not a breakdown. And in, in fact, that's what it ended up being. Um, it took some months to integrate, but when I finally went back to work, uh, my salary went up. And then over the next three years, my salary tripled. 
people had a lot of complimentary things to say about my work and, and things like that. And, and that was important because when your family's looking at you every day, like, are you okay? You know, do you need to talk to a psychologist? Something like that. Uh, salary makes a difference, you know, so that sort of shut them up, you might say. All right. So uh, when I got into this work, now that was in 1996 when this happened to me. So why did I wait until 2007? Um, I had just gone sort of back to my life. Um, but with the exception that I had been in advertising, I'd been working in advertising and I wanted to get out of that area. And uh, I had a vision where I was, I was had a dream where I was told to go to Peru. And that's where I met my wife and she was from Brazil. And I moved to Brazil, became an English teacher. And it was, I guess, five, six years after being in Brazil that my wife's nieces had episodes um, that were being diagnosed bipolar. And so I wanted to know, well, what was the difference between what happened to me, which had been so beneficial, and what was happening to them where they were being medicated for life? You know, that's that's what their future was looking like. And so I put up this video called, Am I Bipolar or Waking Up? with this idea that I would share my story and then I would wait for the feedback to come back to see if anybody resonated, to see who was medicated for life, who was receiving a bipolar diagnosis, et cetera. And the feedback I got was huge. I just got people from around the world contacting me and talking to me about their spiritual experiences. And yet they had this bipolar diagnosis um, based on a series of episodes that were called acute psychosis, okay? So that was my channel. It's up until today. I did recently change the name to Bipolar Awakenings, but that's where things started, all right? And uh, along with getting feedback from people around the world, I was studying as well. And I'd already studied the work of Dr. Stanislav Grof, but I was looking at other theorists, other pioneers, and I was comparing what they wrote about with my nieces and the people that I was learning from online, right? So Dr. David Lukoff was an important psychologist to learn from, as well as uh, Dr. Lauren Mosher and Dr. John Weir Perry, both who had had clinics in the early 1980s where they had worked with people in the so-called uh, first break of acute psychosis in a completely unmedicated way. So they were they completely unmedicated and we're reporting excellent results, all right? So that was an eye opener for me. Like previously, previous to doing the work, I knew about the work of Stan Groff, but I knew nothing about Lauren Mosher, John Weir Perry, and also the work of um, Dr. R.D. Lang and a few others, right? So there was a legacy of people treating psychosis in a completely different way, all right? And based on all that research, I made a lot of videos and I made uh, slideshow videos where I rarely showed my face. I used a lot of imagery to really convey a variety of aspects of what constitutes uh, a spiritual breakthrough, an acute psychosis, whatever you want to call it. And most of the time I would use the term bipolar, you know. So you can see in the upper left-hand corner, I, I had the somewhat cocky title of the real cause of bipolar disorder. And uh, that's where I talk about the collapse of the ego that happens when you have a lot of triggers coming into play. For example, in my case, I had a scuba diving accident. I was changing cities, changing jobs. I was in a self-help seminar that was very intensive. All of these things came together to sort of launch me into the non-ordinary state. But we talked about the potential for suicide, hallucinations, um, family traumas, paranoia, why people think they're Jesus, all kinds of aspects, including some other personal stories as well about, for example, a Kundalini experience I'd had a few years later, things like that. So just covered the whole gamut of uh, potential experiences people have when they had the bipolar disorder label. All right. Okay, and then in total, I've made over 90 videos, over 3.5 million views, 25,000 subscribers, and they've been translated into six languages, all right? I published my book, Am I Bipolar or Waking Up, in 2011. That book was actually a little bit like my resume, you know? This, this book let people know the details of my story and where it led to and why it motivated me to start to do this work, especially around, you know, the, the health of my nieces. I've also been involved in a number of conferences 
Um, through incredible synchronicity, I was one of the founders of the Crazy Wise Conference in Rotterdam, the later in Amsterdam. And that was quite an interesting situation because I'd put up a video saying that I was going to Europe and if anybody wanted to work with me, okay? And I had four different people from the Rotterdam area ask me if I wanted to do a seminar and they didn't know each other. And I introduced these four people to each other and they created the Crazy Wise Conference. And it was the only place in Europe where anybody had approached me about doing a seminar, right? That's been going on for over seven years. And online uh, in 2015, uh, Dabney Alex created the Shades of Awakening um, seminar. It was an online online conference. I helped her put that together. I promoted that a lot. And that led to a Facebook group called Shades of Awakening, which exists now. If you've had a spiritual emergency or, or have a spiritual dimension to your disorder, I highly recommend that group. It's probably the best support group online available today. All right. So that's the background. So I've been at this for a while in a variety of forms. And now let's take a look at some of the theory that I've come up with around uh, what constitutes sort of a spiritual experience and how that relates to mental illness, right? And first, oh, and we'll look at practice later, okay. So first let's take a fact check here. Please understand, uh, contrary to common belief and, and mainstream thinking, at the moment, there is no scientific evidence that bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or any mental illness in the uh, Psychiatric Diagnostic Manual, DSM, is genetic. And I'm sure that comes as a surprise to a lot of you because, you know, normally we're taught that mental illness is a genetic thing. Actually, they have no proof. There's no blood test. There's no MRI. There's no PET scan. There's nothing. And the situation is so dire for psychiatry they have spent over $8 billion in research, and it has led to nothing related to the genetic roots of mental disorders. It is such an embarrassing situation that a very prominent psychiatrist, Dr. E. Fuller Torrey, who is a very strong advocate for psychiatric medications, he's almost considered like the Dr. Evil for anti-psychiatry. He, he really champions psychiatry. And yet he has come forward and said that spending more money looking for the genetic roots of uh, psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia is basically would be basically the same as investing more money into the search for Bigfoot, which apparently the politically correct term for Bigfoot now is Yeti. We wouldn't want to offend Bigfoot. Um, but yeah, it, it would be like, uh, you know, spending more money looking for Bigfoot. I mean, that is a pretty embarrassing place for psychiat psychiatry to be right now. Um, they've spent so much money and literally come up with nothing. Okay. So with that said, knowing that mental disorders do not have uh, genetic roots, or it certainly hasn't been proven, still, we tend to see spiritual emergency as a challenging blessing. And I'll just, to recap again, for those who, who aren't familiar with the term, I think this is a good uh, definition. A spiritual emergency occurs when the process of spiritual awakening accelerates to the point where it becomes destabilizing for both the body and mind. That's a good enough definition for me. Um, but then we tend to see bipolar disorder as something quite distinct and different as a mental illness. And then, of course, schizophrenia as a more severe mental illness. So I've got a little quiz for you guys. Okay. So... From a psychiatric perspective, acute psychosis could fall into any of these categories, really. They, you could compartmentalize them into any. But what do you think? If someone has the symptoms of an ecstatic mood, a feeling of oneness, a sense of newly gained knowledge, or heightened senses, would that be spiritual emergency or bipolar disorder? Well, I had all of these symptoms uh, in my experience or sensory experiences, and for me, it was clearly a spiritual emergency. But if you speak to people online who've been, been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, they have a lot of these symptoms too, right? How about these delusions? You're dead or going to heaven. You're being tested by God. You're the central character of a movie like The Truman Show. You're a Messiah figure. Or you have magical powers. 
Well, in my case, I had the first three. I thought I was dead. I was being tested by God. I was the central character of some sort of theater or movie. But I didn't think I was the Messiah because I was dead and I couldn't save the world if I was dead. So at least I was saved from that one spiritual delusion. Okay. These are very common for a spiritual emergency, but they pop up a lot for people with bipolar disorder. Now, how about this group? Peeing on the floor of a hotel ballroom, taking your clothes off in public, resisting arrest by the police, visual or audible hallucinations, suicidal thoughts, paranoid thoughts. Well, uh, peeing on the floor of a hotel ballroom, guilty as charged. I thought I was going to meet God. I was being tested by God. And part of it meant letting go of my fears. And I needed to pee. And so I just let it go in the middle of a five-star hotel ballroom and then actually laid down on my own urine, all right? Um, when they came and asked me to put my clothes on, because I had taken my shirt off, I took my pants off because I thought I was being tested. And then when the police came, I, I just, I sort of fought them off, you know, to a certain degree until I realized I really needed to go with them. And then I kind of surrendered. I didn't have much of a choice. So I wasn't particularly violent. I, I just resisted, you know. I also had um, some very subtle hallucinations, uh, a light in the ceiling turned pink, you know. Um, I didn't have any suicidal thoughts, but Dr. David Lukoff did in his spiritual emergency. And then paranoid thoughts can pop up as well, although uh, certainly less so in spiritual emergency. But, you know, clearly all of these uh, symptoms, we might say, or phenomena could be associated with what you would think of as a you know, serious mental disorder or bipolar disorder, even a schizophrenia, but a lot of them showed up in my experience and, and very difficult experiences like these can pop up for other spiritual emergencies as well, right? So what is that, where does that take us? Okay, well, I think we need to stop looking at spiritual emergency, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia as very distinct things. The truth of the matter is, that we have this enormous spectrum of experience and there is no fine dividing line. And in the book, uh, Psychosis and Spirituality, Consolidating the New Paradigm, which was edited by Isabel Clark, Mike Jackson said um, in his chapter, detailed comparison of the experiences described in these groups found that while most of the distinctions cited in the literature between psychosis and spirituality had some value as generalizations, none were watertight in the sense of clearly separating the groups. So it wasn't just my experience in talking to people online where I was like, wow, there's really no place to, to sort of parse this out. It's It's been found in published research as well, okay? So, but what do we make of it, right? Well, in this spectrum, we can say that at one end of the spectrum, there is content that can be very disturbing. In those, in the disturbing content, people have the experience that something is happening to them. The experience is externalized. There's more fear involved. It's scary, it's frightening. In that moment, people are more defensive and potentially violent. There's much more violence. And the understanding of what's happening is much more concrete. So that if a person, for example, has a vision of a demon coming at them, it's a real demon for them. There's there's just no way for them to interpret it otherwise. You know, If they think they're Jesus, for example, they would be the one and only Jesus and you need to bow down to them or you might have to you know, feel their wrath, something like that. At the other end of the spectrum, you have more blissful content where the person will have some inkling that something is going on within them even when I was shackled to a hospital bed, I knew that something was going on within me, that I was in an inner transformation of some kind. It's a much more loving place. There's a lot more affection given from people in these non-ordinary states. It tends to be non-violent and interpretations can be more symbolic, like recognizing that you're some sort of Messiah figure and, and not against the idea that you might be in touch with a, a kind of divinity within you. You know, so more loose interpretations. Okay, so you've got that range of experience. And on the whole, the disturbing content tends to get labeled schizophrenia. The more blissful content can be interpreted spiritual emergency by people who are aware of that term. Okay, and bipolar disorder tends to be a mix of both. 
you get the disturbing content with the blissful and it comes and goes, it, it tends to be mixed, right? But what's the source of this divergence, okay? What makes one person have, you know, a terrifying, horrific experience where they're potentially violent and they really should be medicated immediately versus someone who could be, you know, supported lovingly and perhaps pass through this thing within a week without, without issue, you know? What's the source of that divergence? Well, one important characteristic and another fact check is that trauma actually causes mental disorders, okay? Recent research from 2022, a meta-study has found just that, okay? Crossing a wide variety of uh, uh, research papers and studies upon studies. Yes, trauma is a deciding factor. And one a very prominent uh, psychologist, Dr. John Reed, has been quoted as saying that childhood physical and sexual abuse are incredibly predictive of psychosis, much more than any genetic factor. And in fact, I read one uh, research paper some years ago saying that if you had been sexually penetrated by more than one adult before the age of 10, your chance of um, developing schizophrenia multiplied by 50, all right? So these are you know very important factors to consider that are rarely mentioned when you visit a psychiatrist. All right, so one factor we need to look at is trauma. And people have a range of trauma from the very severe to the mild. And I would describe, you know, severe trauma would be repeated sex abuse, for example, maybe a mid-range thing being high school, uh, high school bullying, that's very common. And then on the mild end, even emotional repression can be a form of trauma. It was certainly something that I was dealing with in my spiritual emergency. Okay, then the other characteristic is maturity. Uh, we can look at it and call it the evolution of consciousness for those of you who are familiar with spiral dynamics or Ken Wilber's work, all right? And to start, there is a relationship between trauma and maturity in the sense that when people are severely traumatized, it is more difficult for them to mature into adulthood, all right? And when people have less trauma, it's, it's much easier. So we do have a relationship there, okay? And then looking at consciousness, um, just to give some more tangible labels to this, um, keeping things simple, we can say that someone who has, you know, hasn't really developed their level of consciousness would be someone who is more selfish, egocentric, and impulsive, all right? And then they'll go through various stages of someone who we might consider postmodern, very diversity-oriented, um, intuitive, these sort of characteristics, okay? Okay, and one thing that's interesting, when you look at people who are at earlier levels of development in their maturity and their consciousness, they see the world in a way that's more externalized. For example, they, they, regular, they regularly see themselves as the victim of their circumstances. Things happen to them without them realizing their own role in, in what's happening. They have a more fearful orientation, they are more violent, and they interpret life in a more concrete way. When people are more developed, they have a more internalized way of relating to the world, accepting responsibility for their life circumstances. They are more loving in a ver more variety of situations. They are more nonviolent and interpret life in a more symbolic way. So those characteristics should look familiar, right? because they're the same characteristics we saw when people go into psychosis. So it seems that how people go into psychosis uh, and how they interpret their psychosis reflects how they're interpreting their regular life as well when they're grounded. And so what we have is a, a framework where when people are severely traumatized and they have a lower level of development, they're, they're not as mature, they tend to have a more disturbing type of psychosis. When people are less traumatized and are more developed, they have a more blissful type of psychosis, like what you associate with spiritual emergency. And then the vast majority of people have what I would call a mix of the blissful and disturbing. And that can flip very quickly from, you know, feelings of oneness and connectedness. And then all of a sudden you're just terrified, you know, that can happen in acute psychosis. Um, and so with that, these 
disturbing experiences tend to be labeled schizophrenia, particularly when they have more of a dominance of disturbing hallucinations and paranoia by psychiatry. The blissful, when the label is aware, when people are aware of the label, would be spiritual emergency. And then in the middle, bipolar disorder tends to be somewhere in between, okay? But notice the overlap. I mean, there's no clear distinction between these labels. Um, and if you went to a psychiatrist, one could give you the label spiritual emergency. The other would say, well, you've got bipolar. Um, or they might say you've got uh, schizoaffective disorder, but another might say schizophrenia, depending on the symptoms that you're showing. All right, so there's no clear distinctions. And with that, the probably, probability of healing, whether you're in a healing program or just on your own, is gonna be a lot higher if you're in the upper right-hand corner of this model. It's gonna be lower if you're in the lower left-hand corner. That's just the reality of the situation. The more disturbing the psychosis, the less sort of internal resources you have to deal with that situation, the more difficult the trauma is that you're dealing with, it just becomes a more difficult um, situation to deal with on the whole. So when I'm working with clients, and we'll get into how I work with clients in the future, I am looking for people sort of on that mild side with more development, simply because I think it's a safer proposition for them and for me, and it's a better investment for them. Because when you're working with people who have been medicated for life, regardless of where they are on this spectrum, it's always going to be a challenge, you know. So when people come to me and they're medicated for life with a diagnosis of bipolar, I am looking for characteristics to sort of nudge them into that upper right-hand side. Okay, but what do we make of this model, okay? It's, it's quite different than, you know, what anybody's learned from psychiatry. It's even different for transpersonal psychologists where they've, they've been taught that mental illness is something very different for spiritual emergency for the most part. So what to make of that? Well, this has got implications. It appears that mental illness is spiritual in nature. That's the first thing, because look at this overlap from spiritual emergency into bipolar disorder, into schizophrenia. The symptoms are completely fluid. If, if the symptoms are fluid and there's no way of distinguishing these things one from the other, then the implication is that schizophrenia itself is, in a sense, a spiritual disorder. Bipolar disorder is a spiritual disorder. And with that, we need a completely different framework, okay? The biological model is just not working, okay? The other thing, as we already mentioned, everybody has the potential to heal, although it will be more challenging than others, for, uh, for some than others. And finally, with this model, we can say, hey, you know what? Madness makes sense. When people are more traumatized, they have less development, they have more disturbing psychosis. When people are less traumatized, they have more development, they have more blissful acute psychosis, and you can actually work through that. It makes it starts to make sense of what is regularly thought of as chaos, the chaos of a broken mind, right? So I think it's very refreshing to say, hey, we should be able to understand these things now. It makes a little bit more sense. Okay, and more implications that if bipolar disorder and schizophrenia are caused by emotional trauma, well, where is the trauma? That's another question, right? Well, it's time for a new paradigm because when we look at the medical model, you know, medicine sees us as muscles and bones and biochemicals, and of course, all of that's there, but it can't find where our issues are, where our emotional issues are, or where our emotions are to begin with. However, if we use an analogy from transpersonal psychology, and in this case, we're looking at the artwork of Alex Gray, we can start to assume that we have a bioenergetic system running through our entire body, a chakra system, you might say, okay? And if we look at our, ourselves as having a chakra system, we can make the assumption that trauma is held in blockages energetic system, right? This is this is coming from the theories of Dr. Stanislav Grof, and it's not based on scientific fact, but it's based on multiple um, episodes of scientific observation and what people are reporting, how they're feeling, okay? So to heal the disorder, these blockages must be released. So it's a whole new thing. And that's where we come to a whole new practice. 
So what are we going to look at here? Well, one way to deal with things somatically, which is to work with the bioenergetic system that's going through, through the entire body, is with holotropic breathwork. And I want to take a look at that. I'm a certified holotropic breathwork facilitator, and I want to tell you about that a little bit. Okay. So holotropic breathwork was created by Stan and Christina Groff in the 1970s. Holotropic means moving in the direction of wholeness. It's a technique for liberating trauma using voluntary over-breathing, okay? So it's not hyperventilation. It's something that you're doing intentionally. And uh, once the hyperventilation or the over-breathing kicks in, it brings up material from the unconscious. And in that moment, the client is invited to express their inner experience without any sort of repression. All right. Evocative music enhances the breather's ability to connect with powerful emotions arising from the unconscious. And a certified facilitator with Groff transpersonal training or Groff legacy training must be present to provide protection, support, and body work to breathers. Sometimes that's necessary as well. A full holotropic breathwork session uh, lasts three hours. It's a trademarked format. So there's a lot that goes into uh, uh, a trademarked holotropic breathwork session. You've got to have a certified facilitator. The music needs to follow a particular pattern. It's got to be three hours. There needs to be you know, various factors in place. All right. Well, what does the breathing do? Well, I think a great analogy is to look at a surfer before a person can surf, they need to get out on the water and they need to swim, okay? But once they're in contact with the waves, they can just swim a little bit and then they get up on their board and they don't need to swim anymore. Then they're into the full expression of, you know, how to ride that wave. Well, in the same way, we're swimming out to meet the ocean of the unconscious. And when we meet the waves of the unconscious surfacing, then we don't need to breathe anymore. We can just sort of ride it out and, and move with it. OK, so it's very common, for example, to see people in holotropic breathwork do this. They'll be. Um... And then they'll just freeze in a moment of ecstasy for like a minute or two minutes. OK, so once the person is in touch with the unconscious, then they're encouraged to to um, move and express themselves uh, with their body and through vocalization. Okay, so here's just a few images from a trailer done on holotropic breathwork. People breathing, breathing in their own style. Um, sometimes things can get very physical with deep stretching. Sometimes physical contact is what's in place and, and, and what's needed. Uh, sometimes people have very specific tensions that need to be worked through and then um, the facilitator will come along and, and help them work through that. And it's usually done in a group environment, although I work with people privately quite a bit, but uh, holotropic breathwork groups are quite common in Europe, a little less common in the United States because um, people are still, it's a very innovative and new style of therapy. Um, even though it started in the 80s, it, it's taking a while to sort of grab hold, you know? And one thing that's important to remember as well is that you know, where is the healing coming from? Well, the healing, according to Stan Groff, is coming from what we would say is the inner healer. It's a divine intelligence that's within you that is getting activated when you're doing this overbreathing and you're in a safe setting. And so that's how that's how it all unfolds. This healing agent is bringing you this material for you to work through. Okay, holotropic breathwork, it has the capacity to release physical tension, life trauma, perinatal trauma, repressed emotions like anger, sadness, fear, and joy, sexual repression, and spiritual energies of a divine or demonic nature. All right. So all of that can be released with holotropic breath work. Many people wonder if it's like a drug experience or a psychedelic experience. Yes and no. While the experience can feel almost overwhelming, most people will be aware that they're in the room and being supported most of the time. However, people may forget where they, where they are for periods, particularly if they're in a powerful experience, and they may even no longer hear the music. And in the beginning, for example, the music is a lot of very powerful drumming, and sometimes it all just drops away and people don't hear anything at all. Few misconceptions about holotropic breath work. First, there's no specific breathing style, and that's very unusual because almost every breath work practice, like especially pranayama, 
you know, in through the nose, out through the mouth, hold for six seconds, release for six seconds, things like this. With holotropic breath work, you're just um, encouraged to breathe aggressively and in your own style. It is dangerous to try to do this without a certified facilitator. If you think you're going to do this on your own at home, you'll be in for a uh, unpleasant surprise. Please don't do this at home. You can lose pain reception in, in, in your body, and then you might want to punch things or bang your head against things, which can lead to injury. You can have experiences that sort of catch you off guard. You might start projecting things and want to sort of take radical action, like want to run out into the street or something like that. So you really need a, a facilitator with you to, to protect you during these processes. And all breathwork styles are not alike. So uh, holotropic breathwork has the potential to be an extremely powerful process. Other breathwork styles are not so different from meditation, to be quite honest. So there's a lot of people out there who will say, yeah, I've tried breathwork. And then once I push them, almost nobody has done holotropic breathwork. It has tended to be a very niche thing up until now. It's a little bit expensive and it requires some dedication, you know? So all this is great. You know, let's do holotropic breath work for everybody, right? Except that the majority of certified facilitators will not work with people diagnosed with mental disorders because in a group context, they're concerned that someone with a deeper disorder will have material surface that they cannot contain safely, okay? The, the, the person may enter into a space where they could disturb the other breathers that are in the room. So once I learned about that, I started to ask myself, well, what could I do where we could use breath work? And so I started the Bipolar Awakenings Healing Retreat in order to create a highly secure environment. And with that, I modified holotropic breath work to what I called bipolar breath work to provide more flexibility. In particular, I would let clients stop breathing whenever they wanted. I wouldn't push them to do a three hour session. Most of the clients that I'm working with are breathing on a regular basis, like every day, but they're breathing between an hour and 90 minutes. Okay. Some of the logistics for the bipolar awakenings healing retreat. It's in a safe location away from the city where neighbors won't be bothered by the noise because sometimes screaming can happen. And of course we play loud music. A typical retreat lasts 10 days. Uh, my first retreat that I did, I actually booked three weeks to work with one person. And the idea was that I would have one week just in case they went into psychosis, I could support them to see if I could get them back without taking them to the hospital. But what I found was over time that after 10 days, people were really exhausted and they really couldn't do anymore. So that became sort of the limit. And then each client must bring with them a trusted supporter. Obviously this work is very, and if family members are upset or they think that I'm some sort of a scammer, things can really you know, go south quickly. So uh, I insist that somebody bring a family member or a friend with them to support their process. It also helps them prepare and with the integration phase so that afterwards, if they want to talk to somebody, I'm not around, they at least have their supporter they can talk to. All right, a little bit about bipolar breath work. Because our retreat is individual, we're in a safe environment and our clients have our complete attention. And we breathe almost every day of the retreat and have encountered only minor problems, which has been really uh, encouraging. Okay. This was a retreat house we, we were using in 2015. It was a house borrowed from our brother-in-law's father. Okay, But it really shows the kind of privacy we're looking for. And uh, when, I, when I have a chance to do like a five-star retreat, I like to be in a place similar to this. It's down here in Brazil. Okay. And we've had some good results. Over 50 retreats since 2013 with over 40 clients conducted these retreats in various countries, the U.S., Mexico, Romania, Germany, Finland, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Brazil. And 10 clients have done more than one retreat. Okay. Uh, and what, what I found is that usually clients to really get off their medications and things like that, they're going to need more than one retreat. You can't sort of undo a lifetime of traumas and difficulties in, in 10 days. Uh, we're good, but we're not that good. Nobody has entered into psychosis, which people tended to be concerned about. And, and when I tell certified facilitators that I'm taking this technique, holotropic breathwork, which is contraindicated for people with bipolar disorder, 
and I'm using it and I'm breathing with people every day in a 10 day retreat, their jaws drop. They just can't believe it. It's, it's quite a discovery. Um, and the bigger discovery is that what happens is people don't edge toward psychosis. They actually become more grounded. They get more relaxed and they actually end the 10 days quite exhausted. Okay. And uh, clients, as I mentioned, they've responded very well to the techniques. Psychiatric medications have not had a negative impact either. When people come on retreat as part of our agreement, I insist that they remain on their psychiatric medications for at least a few months after our retreat, just to see how they're responding to the work in the long term. I was certified by uh, Groff Transpersonal Training in 2016, and since then they've endorsed the work and actually recommended it to a few people. And I've had some clients who've been off medications for years now and have gone on gone public about their achievements. So that's been really great. One client in particular, Monica Kettler, is working as a uh, gestalt therapist and licensed alternative therapist in Germany. She's actually doing work similar to myself now. So, so that was very encouraging. Few limitations. At this point, the retreat can be expensive for people, especially people who have lost their jobs due to their bipolar disorder. So private care for 10 days, even if I'm not earning very much, can be an expensive thing. I've really only been able to do this because I live in Brazil. And the re results have been more immediate and obvious for people with milder disorders and those with more maturity. So that fits into the model that I was talking to you about. You know, if people have had less trauma, they've had more development, they tend to do better. I have worked with people sort of in that, you know, lower left corner of the spectrum, and it has been more of a challenge. And it is important to ac limit access to the retreat for people who don't understand what's involved, okay? So if people come to me and they're just, please, please, I need your help, I need your help, but they don't, they haven't done their homework, they haven't watched the videos, I won't work with them. And innovations continue. You know, one of the incredible innovations out of bipolar breath work, for example, is that uh, I learned that myself and, and others, including Monica Kettler, on our retreats, we're actually absorbing energies from the clients. And that put us in a position where uh, we were quite exhausted. I was having nightmares related to the client's materials. So for example, if a client was working through a lot of fear, I would be having nightmares full of fear. If it was anger, I would have nightmares full of anger. And eventually, uh, together with Monica Kettler, we realized that if we did breath work on behalf of the client, that we could work through the client's materials. And that was a very surprising uh, and huge breakthrough. It's still controversial, even, even within the Groff circles, but we call that surrogate breath work, where we would breathe on behalf of a client. And so today, when I do my retreats, I tell my clients, look, if you don't believe in it, it's just better for me to do it for my own sort of spiritual and emotional hygiene. So my typical retreat would be my client breathes in the morning, then we take a break, and then I breathe on behalf of the client in the afternoon. That's typically how it goes. And we've continued to innovate as well. Um, I've done this work at a distance for people, where I call it distance surrogate breath work. It seems that the healing field is quantum. There's no time and no space there. So work can continue from there. And other innovations have continued, but I, I think that's enough for today. It's been a lot of information. And uh, if you've got any questions about this work, about bipolar breath work, um, surrogate breath work, et cetera, please see my website, bipolarawakenings.com. All of my videos are well arranged in a series of uh, menus there, okay? So you can take a look at all my material at my website and we can go from there, okay? So that's about it. And I think I'll stop sharing my screen, bye-bye. You know, Sean, um, I found that fascinating too. The um, One of the questions I might have is when you get to that point where you're saying that people are having spiritual awakenings, but it's an emergency, when are people having spiritual awakenings and it's not an emergency? What's the difference there? Is there a gray place there as well too? Is there a gray place there? That's interesting. That's an interesting question because, um, you know, what's going to dictate a spiritual emergency? You know, nobody in a spiritual emergency is going to check themselves into a psychiatric hospital. You know, it's pretty rare. 
for people to go, wow, I'm really feeling freaked out. I better go to the psychiatric hospital. No, somebody is going to check you in. You know, in my case, I had taken off all my clothes. I was refusing to put them back on. I was going to get hospitalized. So if you're in a spiritual emergency situation, chances are somebody's going to check you into the psychiatric hospital. Um, or you might be very frightened. It might be very extreme. The spiritual emergence that Groff talks about is something that's a little bit easier to integrate. You know what's going on. And I had had a spiritual emergence actually a few years earlier. I had moved from Toronto to Vancouver, and I had a number of synchronicities uh, take place during that trip, which had been so powerful that it converted me from being an agnostic, almost an atheistic type of person to believing in God again. So that spiritual emergence really prepared me for the spiritual emergency that I had. So it was just something that was easier to integrate, but it did get me thinking about the world in a completely different way. Okay, so okay. thank you. Another question um, that we're seeing in our chat is that you ask people to do the homework um, beforehand. Could you give us some idea of what that homework is like that you ask people to do? Sure. I have a series of videos in sequence on my website and on YouTube about bipolar disorder. I ask my, my clients to watch them all, all right? And uh, I, I like them to read my book as well, because then that really builds the trust because they know my story and they realize that before I'm a therapist, I was a I, I was a person who was in the hospital. You know, I was I was in that hotel ballroom. So I come to them as a peer first, but just someone who's further along the healing path. So that builds a little bit more trust. You know, it's a little bit like being the coach who has played the game as opposed to the coach who hasn't played the game, you know? Yeah, very nice. Um, yeah, I was wondering earlier um, about the fact that you focus on bipolar, but I see that the gamut goes into schizophrenia certainly as well. And um, I think that um, people would question, um, what do they do if they fall into that schizophrenia realm where you're saying it's harder for them to deal with breath work? Do they just stay on meds and read or what do they do to help get themselves along on that continuum that you outlined? Right. Well, it's important to remember that, you know, the word schizophrenia, bipolar, spiritual emergency, these are just labels for categories of symptoms. Okay. Mm -hmm. And actually, in the 1990s, in the 1980s, when Groff was writing, he was talking about spiritual emergency being misdiagnosed as, as schizophrenia. He never even used the term bipolar disorder. Right. So somewhere along the way, psychiatry decided that acute psychosis that starts with mania and, and goes full-blown psychosis is bipolar. It's not schizophrenia. I don't know when they did that. And even today, more conservative countries uh, that's been my experience online, more conservative countries tend to use the label schizophrenia more often, right? So these are just labels. If you've been diagnosed that way, chances are it's because you're dealing with more paranoia. And paranoia is harder because what it is, it's and it's spiritual too. And this is something that Groff talked about. It's a projected fear, so you're dealing with a fearful experience that you're not owning and you're seeing around you. And if you're projecting your experience, you're suffering unnecessarily and there's no healing taking place if you're projecting your experience. So to, to be off your medications to be and to be continually paranoid, I think is really counterproductive. It just leads to unnecessary suffering. For me, it's like, take those meds, you know? But if you're somebody who thinks, hey, you know what, I want to explore my inner experience. I want to explore my paranoia. I think in that case, you need a longer relationship. You might want to sit down and have talk therapy for you know a good amount of time before you really start to get in touch with those energies because they can be absolutely terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so another question that we have here is, you know, I know that it's not, there is no typical person and no typical experience, but how long have you found that it might take someone to integrate a spiritual emergency experience? I would say if you haven't integrated within a year, mm -hmm. then I think you need to start to consider 
another interpretation for what you're going through because you know it's quite a destabilizing thing and you're you know you're losing functionality you're losing your ability to work you're you could be damaging relationships you know when you're in these spaces and i have met people who have seen themselves in really extended spiritual emergencies and their lives are falling apart and my question to them is how is this working for you it's it's not it's not doing you any good to see your endless periods of non-ordinary states as uh, spiritual emergency. You're stuck, you know, like face to a certain degree, you need to face reality, I, I think. Very good. Now, another question is um, obviously this one begs an answer um, because people would really consider it. Should people go off their meds if they are confident they're really having a more spiritual experience versus psychosis. All right. Well, to start, um, about 80% of people when they're medicated will go off their medication. This is just, nobody likes being on medication. So they're just going to drop it and then see what happens. Okay. And believe it or not, um, there is some long-term studies About that, where apparently when after people have been medicated by psychiatry, 40% who stop their medications actually do like do okay. You know, this was a long-term study mentioned in Mad America, right? But if you're a person who's had repeated episodes, my suggestion is to just remain on your medication and, and continue to work on your healing practice, you know. And by healing, I mean something deep, like what I'm doing. Um, bipolar breath work, that kind of thing. If you find another somatic healing practice that works for you, terrific, you know, go for it. But I'm not talking about a coping strategy, all right? A little shit like paying it, like for example, making sure you get enough sleep, watching your diet, meditating for maybe 10 minutes a day. These are all great things, but they're coping strategies. They're not healing strategies. And Doing that, I think you're taking a big risk when you're going off medication. If you're going to work with someone like myself, do some really deep work, you should be really looking for significant shifts in yourself, perhaps feeling excessively tired for months at a time so that you can go back to your psychiatrist and say, look, can we try a slow meds withdrawal because I'm feeling really sleepy? You know? It seems like the, a good sign of healing is that people are feeling over-medicated. Okay, so that takes me to the next question that um, that I had listed. Um, how can people go off their meds appropriately if the doctor is absolutely certain that they've been diagnosed correctly and they're absolutely certain that they're ready to release some of the medita medicated state um, because you know the doctors are invested in those medicines. So wherein lies the um, balance? Yeah, you know, I really don't get into the medication aspect for people that much. But if someone wants to reduce their medication, what options do they have? Sometimes you'll find um, a psychiatrist that's willing to give it a shot. Uh, but I would only ask for like a 20% withdrawal, you know, mm. see how you do with that 20% withdrawal. Many psychiatrists will give you that. Uh, but if you come in and say, I want to get off these medications entirely, Okay, they'll do that for your first episode, second episode, maybe. After that, they're going to give you the reality check. They're going to say, look, you've had three episodes. Um, I can't, you know, in good faith, recommend that you go off your meds. And, and then at that point, what options do you have? You know, I, and I think to a certain extent, you're, you're, you're kind of being irresponsible at that point. If you're not working on your healing, you just want to get off your meds and you've had three episodes, it's uh it's tricky so let, let's say is this the same answer that you would give if someone believes they've been misdiagnosed we know lots of people who have had spiritual emergency experiences but really it's a spiritual breakthrough but if they end up in a psychiatric ward they're going to be labeled and um, what if they think they've been misdiagnosed? Um, do they shop around for the right doctor to help them? Um, or what is the approach that they yeah. could best use? 
Yeah. Um, now, this is my opinion, okay? The idea of misdiagnose is a little bit off because what we're really talking about is an entirely different paradigm for looking at what, you, what you're doing. So from the psychiatric perspective, it's not a misdiagnosis. They've diagnosed you correctly according to everything that they've learned. Okay, we're looking at a totally different paradigm. So the idea that the psychiatrist has made a big mistake isn't exactly accurate, all right? If you're looking for that other paradigm, you know, you, you're gonna have to, it, it's it's tough, it's tough with, with the world of psychiatry. You know, you, if you're in California, you might have a better chance. There are some psych, transpersonal psychiatrists out there. Um, and you might wanna start by finding a, a therapist, like a transpersonal psychologist who can empathize with your position. You know, just the ability to talk about your experiences with your therapist, I think is a good start, you know, because, Right now, most mainstream psychologists are going to be a little bit dismissive of your spiritual experiences. So you'll want to find one that, for example, can at least embrace your your extreme experiences. Very good. Um, and another question here. Um, when someone is in a state of spiritual emergency, what do you think is at the heart of what needs to get resolved for them to recover on a general perspective? Trauma, mm -hmm. that's what needs to, it, it's it's just energies that need to surface, all right? And that's why, like, for example, at Soteria House and at Diabasis, what happened there? People came to them in their first break acute psychosis. So they got no idea what's going on. They'd never been in the psychiatric hospital before either. And then they, this was really interesting because Dr. Laura Mosher found that untrained college undergrads who had high levels of empathy were more effective than uh, PhDs in dealing with like psychiatrists and psychologists in dealing with people in psychosis. And the reason was that when somebody was in psychosis and there became a, a, a moment of conflict or tension, the PhDs would pull rank. They'd say, look, I'm the doctor here. You need to do what I say. And once that, and once they did that, the relationship would break down. Whereas the undergraduate would be like, hey, come on, stop being a dick, you know, sit down over here, let's have something to eat, you know, and 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 talking to them and relating to them as human beings, even though they're in that non-ordinary state, is, is very important. And that's something that our, our medical field doesn't do. They they treat you like you're a criminal for the most part. Wow. They, they certainly don't relate to you. They don't relate to you at all. They're completely cold. Okay, that was... Um... That was an interesting word. They treat you like a criminal. Um, yeah, they do. They come you in and they bring you in in handcuffs. They handcuff you to bed. They drag you into isolation. They don't talk to you. They forcibly inject medications on you. It's a horrible experience, you know. You know, um, a lot of people who come to Spiritual Awakenings International have had powerful spiritual experiences and some of them have experienced what you're talking about and mm -hmm. prior to the experience something set it off um prior to the experience they were perfectly functioning people sometimes mm -hmm. the um the treatment that you've just described um causes them to be less so to be far less functional than they were when they came in um and how do you think as a as a consciousness, we will eventually evolve in terms of the medical community and the overview of people where this view as a criminal might actually fall away and we have, a, let's say, a softer, more compassionate perspective. Well, I think that needs an entire different webinar because there you're talking about the evolution of consciousness and that is a whole other like thing all right but what will happen is that as we evolve as a society and as a culture we are becoming more compassionate you know we are becoming a more compassionate society sometimes things fall on the wayside and, and things like that but with that evolution comes a natural acceptance of spiritual experience extreme experience more compassion for people in extreme experience and so I think it's inevitable. I just don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, but 
it is getting better. And even, for example, in um, certain psychiatric hospitals in Ontario, where you know I was hospitalized in the 90s, they have taken away forced injection because they realize that injecting somebody against their will is a traumatizing experience. And it's like being raped. It's awful. You know, you don't know what's in that med that they, they've got. You're in a non-ordinary state. You've got the hands of six security guards on top of you. It's just a horrible experience. And and they figured that to give forced injection now than they used to be. Yeah. Mm. So things are nudging in the right direction. Well, and of course, the work like you're doing, the book that you wrote, the talks that you're giving like this, the videos that you've created and others like the other people that you mentioned in your presentation who are bringing forth a new concept, a different paradigm. Um, also, hopefully that will work to help um, elevate awareness and um, and create change. Absolutely. And uh, I'd say the bigger movement right now is more of a just an anti-psychiatry movement spearheaded by the website Mad in America and Robert Whitaker's work where, you know, mm -hmm. and his main argument is like, look, you guys are not practicing science, you know, and that hits at the heart of psychiatry because, and he's proving it in his books, you know. So once you take away the whole myth that psychiatry is operating from a scientific foundation, then you need to start to look for other alternatives. And that's where my work shows up. Mm -hmm. And the good. whole concept of spiritual emergency. Yeah. Of course, someone's asking this question, and I'm not sure about the question. If someone starts having a spiritual emergency after a psychedelic or plant or fungi medicine experience, how can a lay person help them? Mm. Well, I guess it depends on the setting that they're in, but they're going to need 24-hour support. And you, you, you have to practice what you would call the concept of being versus doing. And this is something that Lauren Mosher talks a lot about in his book on Soteria. It's about understanding that people are going to respond to you in the quality of your presence. And if you can actually just be with that person and sit with them, just like you would in the psychedelic session, all right, without manipulating, then that's going to help the person work through that that psychosis all right if you're doing things to them it, it's like you you try and take control of the situation that's where they're going to resist and to a certain degree as holotropic breathwork facilitators that's what we're trained to do we're trained to help facilitate a person's non-ordinary state experience through holotropic breathwork without interfering with it or disrupting it or manipulating it or guiding it in any way you know, so it's really about getting your ego out of the way to do that work. So if you've been a trained um, sitter for psychedelic sessions, then you're well equipped to be um, a supporter for somebody in psychosis. With the caveat that, that if if they get violent or if they do, um, they start to break things or or be uh, threatening to other people, you've got to recognize your limitations and know when it's time to call the police. Or or the ambulance. Yeah. Right. Because people so, can die. People can be people can kill other people when they're in acute psychosis. It's not a fantasy. It's happened. Right. You know? So the, the last question then, <clears throat> Sean, and thank you so much for all your insights. Um we're asking here, are there ways to help bring someone out of psychosis without medication? Just the way I said, supporting them through, mm -hmm. right? But for reasons I don't quite understand, if people have had repeated episodes, it gets harder. They get stuck in the process. It's like the, the psychosis becomes a broken record. And, and one of the things that has been, for those of you who remember records, um, <laughs> and one of the things that was interesting is that I did have clients who had manic episodes after we did retreats together and, and some of them were able to internalize that manic episode and get through it and actually reported having healing processes come to them, you know. So, for example, my first client had been hospitalized six years in a row um, 
for months at a time, radically against psychiatric medication. We did one retreat and she went off her meds completely. Uh, I was a little bit bold at the time. And within two months, she was hospitalized. Then I went back to Romania the next year, did another retreat. Then she went off her meds again for nine months and then had another episode. But it was the longest she'd ever been without her meds. Then she went off her meds again and was off her meds for five years with no episodes. You know, So the manias that she was going into after the retreat seemed to be facilitating the healing process. Okay. And good. it's happened with other clients, clients as well. So it gets them unstuck. Very good, Sean. Wonderful perspectives that you shared. Your presentation here was just fabulous. And we thank you for everything that you've gone through to get us to the point of understanding better and raising the consciousness and awareness of what you're talking about here. Thank you. And um, again, uh, working with us at midnight <laughs> was uh -huh. uh, a real commitment. So thanks again, Sean. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. Thanks everybody for watching. So thank you, Sean, for an absolutely fabulous presentation. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be watching this video when we post it on our SAI YouTube channel. Right. Just phenomenal work you've been doing.